Welcome to Smart Health Talk with your host, Elaine McFadden. Welcome, everyone. This is Smart Health Talk radio show. I'm your host, Elaine McFadden. I'm a registered dietitian with a master's in public health. And we're going to be talking healthcare today. We're going to be laying it out for you, uh, giving you some uh, general information, uh, maybe in a way that you're not getting it from uh, the mainstream media. So we're hoping that uh, with our guest today, uh, who is Zach uh, Cald- Caldver, and I'm hoping I'm saying his name right, um, he is just an, an incredible person. I'm going to let you let him kind of go through his credentials for you, because I think he probably knows them better than I do. And But they're, they're quite impressive, and I think after you hear that, you'll have a better idea why I really wanted to have him on the show today, because I think we, as we're looking at healthcare, in my opinion... Um, when we have an American that's not covered with health care, that's one too many because we have that that is like a life and death situation. And um, plus, it just affects every aspect of your life when you're living day by day, afraid that something's going to happen. It probably inf- influences your choices on what you do and don't do. Um, you may wait and let, let a disease progress to a point where it becomes much worse and much more expensive. Just kind of like what happens to our car when we wait too long, next thing you know, we blew the engine. <laughs> and it's like a really big expense. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be going over all that today. We're going to go through the, the different uh, levels of, that we've had been dealing with, uh, with health care as far as pre-Obamacare, Obamacare, uh, kind of where we're at right now with Obamacare, the proposed uh, Trump care, and uh, then what other options that we may have and why some of those may make sense or may not make sense. And so Zach's going to lay all that out for us. I'm going to kick back and let him help go through and explain all this to you. And I guess he's on the line with us. Are you there, Zach? I am. Yay! Hey, Zach. Welcome to Smart Health Talk. And hey, great. It's great to talk to you again. It's been a, it's been a few years. And, yes, uh, I, I appreciate the the work you do and uh, the truth that you get out to people at a time they need it most. Well, the last time Zach that was on our show, every everyone is when we were fighting for Prop Thirty Seven here in California, and that was for labeling GMOs. And he did an an incredible job with that. You were one of the keynote speakers at one of the big rallies. Uh, that we had, as I, if I remember right, and uh, we just we, we did incredible things with uh, Prop Thirty Seven. We moved definitely moved the needle, and we wouldn't be talking about some of the things that we're talking about now if it wasn't for Prop Thirty Seven and everything we did with that. We kind of laid the groundwork. Um, but go ahead and why don't you give us a rundown? That's just one of the many many things that you've been involved in, Zach. That have kind of taken you on this journey of where it pretty much forced you, I guess, uh, your different um, responsibilities and uh, jobs that you were given pretty much forced you to just dive into this whole health care issue and uh, not just dive into it, but really get to know it and understand um, the complexities of it. But you're going you're gonna to take all that and kind of make it easy for the rest of us to understand today because as I sit down and really start thinking about it, I think we all can agree that we have a lot of questions still, and we know that we're hanging out there and we're we're at huge risk right now of being left with no health care, which is a very scary place to be. So go ahead, uh, Zach, why don't you go ahead and tell us about yourself, some of your experience, and then we'll get into just a kind of a quick overview of where we were at in your mind, uh, before Obamacare, and then we'll get into what changed with Obamacare. So go ahead and um, give us a rundown uh, on that. Sure. So, I mean, my education background was a, a bachelor's degree <clears throat> from UCSD in communications and a, and a master's degree from San Diego State in communications. And since that time, which has been about 20 years now, uh, I have been working pretty much on the front lines of a broad range of economic, social, and environmental justice issues. Um, you know, recently I worked for a Prevention Institute, 
which takes a very important and uh, unique approach uh, to how we can address so much of our health care crisis in this country by understanding how you prevent injury, injuries and illness in the first place uh, by addressing the kind of community conditions uh, that create them. Um, I've worked for the Organic Consumers Association, which uh, of course was very GMO related, but also uh, health. It's all about you know, it's all about health and organic farming and uh, and policy. Of, uh, yeah, and policy and you know, taking over our food supply by uh, the pesticide corporations. Um, and as, as I think you mentioned, I was worked on the California Right to Know campaign. Uh, which was to label GMOs here in California. Um, also at the Consumer Federation of California, uh, year after year, we were heavily involved in trying to pass a single payer Med Medicare for all, uh, legislation in California. We came very close a couple of times. Um, but it was, uh, vetoed by, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger and, uh, but we've been too pushing at that. So I have, I have a, definitely a background in single payer, uh, in prevention. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no doubt if you're interested in social and economic justice, then you can't, uh, avoid having to, uh, look very closely at the, uh, Trump care, uh, and what it would do and what it would mean to this country. Uh, and so, that's a little bit of my background, um, and you know, maybe to start out uh, with, uh, I mean, I think, I think we did a good uh, breakdown of some of the stuff that we planned on uh, covering today. But uh, maybe before I get to you know the pre-Obama fair situation and then what it did do well and what it didn't do well. We maybe start with some important context, I think, uh, for everybody to consider uh, when they evaluate why we are why we are uh, basically living in a healthcare system that is unsustainable, unjust, uh, and expensive and demoral. And I think there are a, a set of uh, factors that can help explain. Why we we would actually have a system like this when all our evidence uh, tells us otherwise, and uh, the importance of uh, understanding uh, these factors in this context uh, before we get into the kind of nuts and bolts of the, of the policy. If that, that sounds good to you. Yes, definitely. Um, I think I think people need to know kind of what you know really what what should we be looking at for a good health care program for us. What kind of components should that consist of? So go ahead and give us a, give us an idea on what you think those should be. Well, so so before, you know, I get into some of the specifics of the of the program, I would want people to keep in mind that while we go through today's discussion, uh, I think a lot of listeners and uh, people that actually have to care about the health of others and care about the kind of healthcare system we have that shouldn't be based on profits over people, uh, are going to be asking themselves, you know, well, why aren't we pursuing, uh, any of these, uh, proven solutions to our healthcare system that can save the lives of Americans, uh, as well as save us enormous amounts of money. So I think when we, what we're talking about this, I think it, what we are have to remember is this topic, and especially healthcare, but almost every issue that our country is facing right now is going to expose a dark truth uh, that we're going to need to recognize. And that's we're in the midst of the greatest in income inequality in our nation's history and more than any other country on earth. Uh, American corporations have ascended in power and influence to such a degree that many have more wealth than some of the world's largest co corporations. So as a result of that, our political system has been so corrupted 
by big money. On, on every issue important to improving the lives of people, such as healthcare, our government is pursuing policies that benefit the very wealthy and large corporations at the expense of the health of the people and the planet. So with that context in mind, I'd, I'd like to start with identifying the root cause uh, of our broken healthcare system. And that is, we are the only country in the industrialized world in which healthcare is not a human right but a privilege for those that can afford it. So that means in a privatized system like ours, it's going to put profit ahead of people. And therefore, big business will do what it always does, by law in this country, in fact, maximize profit for its shareholders. So what does that mean in terms of healthcare? Well, that means charge, charge consumers as much as possible uh, for care, provide as few benefits as possible, and then, then offer as weak as plans as possible, which include high deductibles and co-pays, and then pay out as little as possible for the care people do need. And everybody knows this has been has a deal with private insurance companies. And then in terms of prescription drugs, that means, that means we pay by far the highest prices in the entire world. And considering nearly half of all Americans use prescription, prescription drugs, and the U.S. now spends more than $370 billion on them, and these costs are, are rising uh, more than at any point in the last decade, I think that's a good start uh, to understand why our health can, why our healthcare system is simply unsustainable. And that, that's, uh, you know, the ACA or not. But, and it, it, let me provide just some data to prove, to prove what I'm saying. So we are the richest country on earth. We spend nearly twice as much on healthcare as any other industrialized nation on earth. That, and, and three to four times more than many. Uh, that's a total of three trillion dollars a year or, or almost 20% of our budget. Uh, that's ten thousand dollars per person we're spending on healthcare. Yet, we suffer poorer health outcomes in other nations that spend a fraction on healthcare than we do. So for instance, people living in Puerto Rico have a greater life expectancy than the U.S. Americans are twice uh, as likely to be obese as Canadians. Greece has twice as many hospital beds per person. And people in the U.S. are three times more likely to have diabetes than people living in the U.K. And to top it all off, we still have 30 million Americans uninsured. Tens of thousands die every year because they can't afford insurance or they're underinsured simply because of the amount of money they make. And over half of bankruptcies in the U.S. Uh, are due to medical illness and the, the, uh, the cost of our uh, health care system. Well, that's what gets me mad, Zach, that people are dying needlessly just because they don't have health care. That's right, dying and suffering. And uh, going into bankruptcy. I mean, it, you know, you're talking about uh, let's just say a mother of three that is making thirty thousand dollars a year and gets a serious illness. Uh, she might not only die because of the system that we have, but no doubt uh, she's going to go into bankruptcy, and that's going to affect her whole family. Um, so for years you know, to come. Would, yeah, for for years to come. Uh, and so, and, and then, you know, if you want to talk about ranking, we rank 35th in the world in death that could have potentially been avoided by healthcare access, and 26th among the 36 member company, uh, countries of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Basically, it's 36 countries by, by European countries, other allies. So we're, we're at the bottom uh, of uh, a, a whole list of health outcomes. So I think this is why uh, Martin Luther King once said, uh, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Uh, and that, that, that's quite a statement uh, from him. Um, so that's kind of why, how I wanted to, to lay out uh, 
a little bit of context that might help understand why uh, we're still trying to make this system uh, that we've got that is based on popping over people work. So let, let's compare the differences because I think people forget maybe, well, I think people aren't forgetting actually <laughs> the way they're showing up at town hall meetings, um, very upset. It's like, you know, they know yeah. now. They, they're yeah. really starting, and they're starting to feel the, the fear of what it would uh, be like to have to go back to where we were, where people were discriminated against for all different kinds of reasons. And really, um, that's a big core of what's happening, isn't it, Zach? You know, the discrimination uh, against people because they don't have enough money. Because you don't have enough money, we're not going to give you any health care, so we're just going to leave you hanging out there. Uh, to fend for yourself, um, you know, it is that really the kind of country that we want to be? Is what I is why what I seem to ask myself. I would think that's not the kind of country that we are when other countries are doing so much better than us. So, well, yeah, yeah, right. That's what, that's right. And I think I think the key question that every American has to ask themselves is: Do you believe that healthcare is a human right? and not a privilege based on the amount of money that you make. Well, and uh, it's it's the money that we need to pay for it is the big question, but we're going to be getting working towards that uh, as we continue uh, with this talk with Zach, everyone. Yeah. So please uh, stay with us because we're going to get to the, to the nitty-gritty of it, which is how do we pay for this. Um, and, you know, other countries are paying for it. So, you know, there's lots of cost-effective formulas that factor into health care, and prevention and public health is a big one, educating people and making sure that they get tested and we catch disease at an early stage instead of it progressing, as I mentioned earlier in the show. But um, why don't you remind us on where we were at uh, pre-Obamacare, what was happening uh, that didn't happen once Obamacare kicked in, which kicked in around 2000, March 2010. Right. So, I mean, as many as 45,000 Americans were dying each year due to their inability to afford access to health care. And people that were uninsured had a 40% increased risk of death than those insured. And I... That is based purely on how much money that you make. Uh, I, find, I think that on the, uh, is obviously immoral and unjust. But in addition, nearly 50 million Americans were uninsured. Uh, women paid more than men uh, for the same coverage. Uh, people with pre-existing uh, illnesses could actually be denied care. So if you had the misfortune of uh, getting sick or getting cancer or getting injured uh, before you received health care. They would be fine with letting you die uh, and suffer than take on the responsibilities of actually trying to uh, treat you. Help, you, help you recover, right? Yeah. Which is kind of the idea of the health care system. Uh, so, uh, and then also millions of poor Americans who were unable to afford private insurance at that time, many of who, which are children, uh, could not qualify for Medicaid because the, the, the bar was set so low. You had to make so little to qualify for Medicaid that it left out millions of low-income and poor Americans unable to afford private insurance but you didn't qualify for Medicaid. Uh, and so... And, also, and the cutoff, and then I heard stories of people that were, you know, like $30 over, you know, or something like that. Yeah. And then that was it. But that was it, you know. You don't you don't qualify because you're $30 over. Right. And I think I told you the story when we talked the other day uh, that, you know, I suffered a severe shoulder separation Literally one week before uh, I was supposed to start a new job that gave me full healthcare coverage. And once I got that coverage, I called them, 
my insurance company and said, yeah, I need surgery. It's about $25,000 surgery. Uh, and they said, well, when did the incident happen? And I was like, well, it was a few days before I started this job. And I was like, well, that's a pre-existing condition. And they refused to uh, cover it. And, I, and so that, that just shows I mean, when, when the profit motive is at stake, you know, values and compassion and just common sense because it's going to hurt my ability to be productive. Um, aside from me suffering with a, a, a shoulder injury that can't be fixed, uh, it, it has no problem. It, it, it was like, uh, it, it, it wasn't even a question. You know, there was a call asked in just a couple of minutes. So, I, I, so it's basically yeah. these corporations dictating uh, who gets care, who doesn't get care, uh, who lives, who dies. I mean, that's yeah. they're they're right. they're they're the ones dictating, and this is the insurance companies. And the insurance companies, what was different about their power before Obamacare? Well, so I mean, well, so Obamacare did a number of good things. I mean, well, I mean, of course. There was, there was other issues that people couldn't, uh, uh, there were incredible injustices before Obamacare that were rectified. Uh, I mean, over 3 million seniors on Medicare fell into the prescription drug coverage gap, was known as the donut hole, basically. It didn't make any sense. Uh, it required them to pay 100% for the cost of their drugs. Of course, we know how much our drugs cost more than any other country in the world. Uh, and, and, and I said, here's, here's one of the keys of our system is that approximately 30% of the dollars that we pay the health insurance industry, they spend on administrative costs, not providing health care. And that means finding ways to deny coverage uh, and limit benefits, uh, huge amounts of money on advertising, and then exorbitant CEO salaries and bonuses, to name just a few. So, the Affordable Care Act came along, uh, and it de did make some significant improvements to the system. Um, this, of course, banned the denial of care due to pre-existing conditions. That's 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 huge, uh, and it was also ensure 2.5 million young adults that can now stay on the current plan until they are 26. This is obviously critical because we know how much student debt. And how much rising cost of, of tuition and, and uh, you know every, everything related to college has gone up exponentially. So there's so many kids that are not ready to get the, the job that they need or the housing, and that them being allowed to stay on their current uh, health insurance plan was criti a critical. A critical. And unfortunately, and, young people are getting sick. Uh, in ways that they never have before. And we've discussed pesticides and lack of nutrition in our food and those kind of things as confounding factors, but but that's a reality. Uh, yeah. Young people are getting sicker, and, and they maybe they don't get uh, as much disease as the older people, but they are more reckless. So there is, there is a possibility of, you know, some accidents uh, that could be, you know, really bad. And put, you know, again, um, all it takes is like one incident uh, to like wipe you out with health care. All it takes is one. It can be any member of your family that could get sick or be in an accident, and that could be enough to like wipe you out financially and lead uh, and push you towards bankruptcy. And like I said, it, it, it's the number one cause. I mean, it's the number one cause of that bankruptcy, which just makes it all the more uh, immoral. Uh, and uh, and so and, we're all li we're all you know most of us are living in fear all the time because you know well, if you lose your job you know and that yeah, and if you it, lose it, it's really exactly. hard to get it after you lose your job because I've seen how much they want to charge oh you can keep your insurance but we got to pay like two thousand a month or something and you don't have a job yeah right and that and that uh, you know leads to also the wrong kinds of incentives. I mean, you, you have people sticking with jobs that do not make them happy because they don't want to lose their health care. 
That's a good uh, point right there. That's a really good point. Yeah, a lot of miserable, unhappy people out there. And just that fear and stress fa factor, oh, um, it has to be like changing just how we feel. Um, I, when we get up in the morning in our day, I mean, these things like weigh heavy, especially if you have expensive prescriptions and, and you have a, a serious health care issue. Or need yeah, surgery, you know. It's like, how am I going to get my surgery? And and I've lived with someone that needed a hip replacement, and they were in pain every single day. And it 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 took away them, their their personality, their their ability to do their job. And getting that hip replacement just seemed like, you know, something that was just going to be impossible to ever even happen. And so that person has left living in pain and not being able to be productive, as you mentioned earlier as well. So our whole productivity, our mental state, depression, you know, we yeah. just end up on more drugs, which add to the burden of the whole system. And so um, Obamacare did come along and really bring a lot of relief to people. And that's why they're willing to go to these town halls and like fight for their right to be able to hold on to that. because. With the new GOP plan, um, what are some well, of the things that are, are going, oh, we're going to lose? Well, I have a few more things that Obamacare did, and then okay, yeah, go ahead and yeah, because there were a lot of things um, that we forget. Things, but then there were, I think, what also left out and people still forgotten was uh, many of the. Uh, best original parts of this plan that would have more directly addressed the real problem of rising health care costs at a time of stagnant wages uh, ended up getting uh, jettisoned during the base, uh, during the base for the ACA due to horse trading with Big Pharma and the health insurance industry. But before I get to that, just, you know, the few other things that it did was you know, increase Increased funding for community health clinics. Uh, he required insurance insurance companies to spend at least eighty five percent of total dollars on actually providing medical care, rather than uh, on administrative costs. Um, and you know, before that, it was about seventy percent. Um, so that that was important. And then he also closed that donut hole that I just mentioned for uh, Medicare recipients, which means they saved them about 50% on prescription drugs. And I think another big one was you eliminated the cap on lifetime coverage cost limits. This was another sick part of our system before the ACA. What if the insurance company could just put a limit how much health care you get in your lifetime? So you get cancer at a certain age, and of course we know how much it costs. Uh, you to plateau and I'm just say, you're done, you're dead, but at least we don't have to keep paying for you. Um, so he just did that cap. So that, that's never going to happen again. Um, and so I think that's really important. And then, of course, the bottom line is also in the ACA, about 20 million Americans now have health insurance, and millions of low income Americans have coverage through the standard eligibility for Medicaid. Uh, that now exists in 31 states. I think that was one of the best things about it. But, uh, again, going back to the corruption of our system and the power of money, it's important to remember the, the, the best parts of his plan that got taken out. And you can argue he had to do it because of the fear of big pharma and the health insurance industry uh, progressively opposing the bill. Um, but left out was offering consumers a public option, which would be free of the insurance industry, which would yes. sort of provided competition to private insurers. Um, left out was a failure to eliminate the antitrust exemption for the health insurance industry, which continues to consolidate, uh, leading to higher prices and prices and less competition. Not a lot of people know the health insurance industry is exempt from antitrust laws, and that's why there's so much consolidation, that's why there's so little competition, because they can just buy each other up 
Uh, and so, in his original plan, he wanted to end that, but that got stopped. Um, and it also, another big one was dropped was preventing the government from negotiating prescription drug prices or improving, uh, importing cheaper, uh, generic drugs from, drugs from Canada and Mexico, each of which would have saved our country you know, tens of billions of dollars. Um, this, this is again one of those no brainers. There's no, there's no reason we shouldn't have the governor, the, gov the government be able to negotiate down, uh, the, our, the exorbitant cost of prescription drugs in this country. Uh, but the pharmaceutical industry would not have it, so that was left out. Uh, and then the final part that I really was disappointed because I was really, I was writing about this, very involved in this bill, uh, that it left out any really ability to regu to uh, regulate and block exorbitant and justified increases in health insurance premiums. Like there's, there's there's no government action that can say you can't do that, and this of course has been a major flaw because we are seeing premiums increase at a lower rate than they did before the ACA. But when people's wages are stagnant and people are hurting and premiums are still going up, funding 30% a year, you can see why this is unsustainable. But let me just be clear about why these uh, the two industries, big pharma and the health insurance industry, Yielded such power and were able to skirt and get rid of all these really important components of the individual plan. And plus that, uh, the pharmaceutical industry spent $3.5 billion, billion in lobbying from 1998 to 2017. That's far more than any other industry in the country. And they gave over $300 million in campaign contributions. And get this. The health insurance industry was second. They spent 2.5 billion on lobbying, lobbying since 1998, the second highest goal, like I said, after pharma, and they doled out over 147 million uh, dollars in campaign contributions. Contribution. So I think, in return for their largesse and the fear of what might happen if they aggressively opposed the bill, if they started running all those ads like they did against Clinton. Uh, a lot of really great stuff was taken out, and the American people asked out on some of the most important divisions of what that uh, act, the Affordable Care Act, could have provided. So, and so when we're looking back, and people are you know trashing the the Affordable Care Act so much, um, I feel like they keep leaving leaving this part of the story out. Uh, talking about, you know, how that was not the original plan. Uh, the reason that we have these costs going up, they keep blaming Obamacare and it being a bad program, but really it's because of this lobbying and this big corporate money from the pharmaceutical and the healthcare industry uh, that, that those things were lost, and we would be having a whole different conversation about Obamacare right now if those things would have been allowed to stay in. So those are really good points. Thank you, Zach. So go ahead and uh, let me, I'll let you continue with what you felt should be the next part of the story. Well, I mean, you know, I guess, I guess now I have to go to the, uh, we have ten. Okay. We got like ten minutes, so we want to make sure that we get the other important things you wanted to talk about. Oh, so yeah. So Trump cares. Um, you know, it's a really a death sentence for thousands of Americans. It will increase pain and suffering for tens of millions or more. And what it's really about is it gives a six hundred sixty-three billion dollar tax cut to the top two percent and the insurance industry and big pharma, because a lot of the way Obamacare was paid for. Uh, was through those taxes. So, yeah, so how, it, how have we been paying for Obamacare? And then Trump Care is what you were just talking about and saying it's going to be, you know, instead of putting money in a pot to pay for all of our health care, 
We're instead taking that money and giving it to the pharmaceutical companies and the rich. Like they don't have enough money already. They haven't been like taking. It's to me they're taking taxpayer money when they're charging these exorbitant prices. They're stealing our money. Oh, oh, yeah, indeed. And you know, um, can we get rid of insurance companies? Like you, you said there were two really important bills going on right now in California and and New York. Right. So you know, and and Bernie Sanders has a a a similar bill uh, in Congress. Uh, Now it it doesn't have much of a chance of uh, passing, but. Uh, but the New know, York, the New York bill has the strongest uh, it possibilities, does. and of course, the fact that those are the two, you know, biggest states, uh, in California and New York, which both have yeah. similar kind of bills, and those are more of get rid of the insurance company, yeah, I mean, uh, use because, the power of the group right. to negotiate, and that's, and that's why you know that's why they call it Medicare for all. Um, you know, it's, it's similar to a Canadian system, it's similar to a lot of countries' systems, where the cornerstone is it recognizes that healthcare is a right, not a privilege, and no matter who you are, and no matter what you make, uh, regardless of your income, uh, you deserve a right to live and not suffer because of an illness or, or an injury. Uh, so this is the only approach that will cover everyone, Insurance, no one will ever die in this country again because they can't afford health insurance. There's no family will ever go bankrupt again because a loved one suffers an illness or injury. We'll put an end to the yearly massive premium hike and provide Americans better care for less money. Uh, so, you know, it follows, yeah, so you, you, you pretty much, you, you called it. It, it. Basically, we get rid of the health insurance middleman. Uh, and we provide uh, the federal government with the ability to negotiate prices with pharmaceutical companies. Um, there's no profit motive, so rather than 70 or 80 uh, percent of the money that they receive from us going to actually providing health care, it would be 95 percent. In case of Medicare, it's two percent. There's only a two percent overhead. So we, we we know we know this. this the way to go, um, but uh, in terms of uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, misnomers out there about uh, single payer. I don't like to call it Medicare for all, uh, but uh, there's there's no out of pocket cost. You know the high deductible, the premium, the co um, You get you get comprehensive comprehensive coverage. So your plan there's none of those junk plans. They don't give you much. The cost a lot. Uh, that includes hospital out, outpatient medical care and preventive care and dental and hearing. Um, so there's all, all kinds of reasons we should, uh, sh- you know, uh, switch to this system um, based on this. Because you know, once we get rid of the insurance companies, we have enough to pay for everyone to have health care because we don't have to pay for them because they're just really the administrative guy. That's over there, and you set up a system where it's beneficial to them to not give you treatment That's because it increases their profits. Right, and these are you know these are companies like I said, you know, you make trillions of year, trillions of year in profits, and you put them all together. Uh, and the CEOs, you know, make ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars a year. That's all coming out, uh, but could be spent on providing uh, solid health care. Um, so, to this point, uh, California and New York uh, are very close to passing uh, Medicare, Medicare for all legislation. In California, it passed the, the state assembly, and it looks good to pass the state Senate. And, you know, uh, to the question about cost, uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee you know, in California, they, you know, they score all this, these kinds of legislation. Uh, basically, they found that single payer would cost about a third of what it currently costs California. And that's just for the health insurance. So, so you know, without, without co-pays, without insurance premiums, or out of 
pop, uh, pocket cards, you would be paying a little bit more in taxes, and it would be a third to a fourth less than what you pay to in health insurance company. So when you hear a tax on, oh my gosh, it's going to cost the government so much more, yeah, but it's being paid for by uh, a small, tiny increase in taxes, and it would be progressively taxed. Yeah, let, let's tax uh, let's tax sodas, junk food, and uh, uh, tobacco more. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's one way. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders wants to institute a progressive income tax rate for the very very wealthiest have to pay a little more. He also wants to tax capital gains and dividends at the same uh, as income from work. I think a lot of people know that. Uh, you know, people like Warren Buffett uh, pays half in taxes as the secretary does, uh, and that's because investments are not treated uh, uh, in the same way as actually work, which also makes no sense. Uh, you would limit all kinds of tax deductions for the rich, and it would raise the estate tax on the richest point three percent of Americans. So you put all that together, uh, it's easily paid for, and yeah, the average American would pay a lot less for better health care. So, the California bill uh, is basically coming up to a state Senate vote. Uh, Jerry Brown, unfortunately, though he supported it uh, aggressively in 1992, uh, now he seems like he doesn't. But on the same token in New York, so I think he deserves an incredible amount of pressure from voters. Uh, and in New York, it's even closer. Uh, it's, it's, it's also passed the assembly. It's close to passing the Senate. And Cuomo has been, Governor Cuomo has been quiet, uh, on whether he'll sign it, but you know, the word is he's running for president in 2020, and Democratic voters will not be happy, uh, if he vetoes, uh, a, a Medicare for All bill. Which again, a recent study of that bill uh, showed that New York would pay uh, a massive amount of money uh, in health care costs for the average, for the average uh, New Yorker. Um, now, I, unfortunately, it seems like we're running out of time because I wanted to talk a little bit about prevention. Well, yeah, if we can, we want to. I'd like to continue this conversation because um, I feel like this is like the most important topic in the in the country right now, and as a public health dietitian. Um, to me, I know it, there's no doubt in my mind. If people don't have access to health care, uh, there, you know, it's a life and death situation. Because if something happens and they don't have health care, where they need they need something, they need a medication, they need a procedure, surgery, um, and they can't get it, that means they could yeah. die. And I can't just sit back and let let this happen without speaking out. And I can't thank you enough. Um, I know that there was, I just wanted to mention one other thing that you said needs to go, and I think that was Citizens United. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, um, but that's something, you know, maybe we can, um, I wouldn't even mind doing this next week if we could, uh, just to continue the conversation, because I think um, there's still, like, a lot more that you could share with us, Zach, yeah. with, with all your experience. Yeah. I think we just kind of yeah. got the groundwork laid. Now I need to, like, really dig yeah. in deep. And get to yeah. the, get to the layers. And yeah, yeah. Because the last piece that I was going to go into is uh, the fact that uh, you know, seven out of ten deaths in the U.S. are related to preventable chronic diseases, and so this idea that just giving people health care after you're sick is uh, a myopic way of really approaching health care uh, in uh, a holistic way. And so, and I'll just try to say this really briefly, uh, you know, studies have shown that 70% of your health is determined by the behaviors and environment. That means the community conditions that you come to. Yes, yes, so exactly. If a farm, right, so if a farmer's market, if there's less junk food and alcohol advertising, safe parks where you can walk and play, uh, curbing tobacco use, have all been uh, and we can them. we can have this. We can we can have all these things. They try to make us think that we can, but we can. And so I just want to 
Thanks again, Zach. Um, and this this is going up right after the show, everyone. So if you want to share it or listen to it, and then we'll be working on getting it up on our YouTube as well. And uh, thanks, Zach. And um, we'll have all his information uh, there as well if you want to get a hold of Zach. Okay. Bye. KCAA.